Yep. Okay. Um, welcome to the Maxwell School. Welcome to the 2012 Maxwell Policy Research Symposium. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know some of you have come from a long ways away. And uh, I want to uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Len Lopo, who is the director of the Center for Policy Research. Thank you. Yes, good morning and welcome uh, to the Maxwell Policy Research Symposium here at Syracuse University. Um, as Jan said, I am the uh, director. My name is Lynn Lopo of uh, the Center for Policy Research. CPR is a collection of over 60 faculty and graduate students from across the Maxwell School, all of whom have policy interests and who appreciate the value of interdisciplinary work. I can't think of a more timely national issue to, to serve as the focus of this research symposium than the U.S. housing situation. This topic is also perfect for CPR as it involves a variety of urban issues, the financial sector, schools, families, all areas in which research associates have focused their attention throughout the 50-year history of CPR. We are really pleased to sponsor this conference and again to welcome you to the Maxwell School. Uh, if there's anything we can do at any time to make your uh, visit here more pleasant, please let us know. We'd be delighted to help. I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Wazilenko. Dr. Wazilenko is Professor of Economics and senior, uh, senior Associate Dean of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. He has also been Chair of the School's Economics Department and, a, and Senior Research Associate in the Center for Policy Research. He joined the Syracuse faculty in 1986 and, and before that held faculty positions at the University of Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison and Penn State at University Park. Professor Wazilenko has written and lectured widely on public finance topics generally and on firm location and tax, and tax incentives in particular. He's published over 50 papers and books in the areas of state and local finance, firm location, and population decentralization within metropolitan areas. He's also worked as, a finance, uh, as an advisor on fiscal policy in many states and a number of countries throughout the world. Uh, please welcome Dr. Wazilenko. Well, my, um, I'm going to do two things here. One is to uh, talk a little bit about the Maxwell School. Um, welcome some of our speakers and thank you for coming. And then uh, introduce my good friend Jim Fulane. So um, let, me, let me start by uh, saying welcome to uh, all people who've traveled so far and for Susan Walker in particular for agreeing to keynote this uh, conference and uh, for Jan for putting it on and uh, all the staff who work so hard to make these things actually happen. So uh, thank you all. Uh, let me say a little bit about the Maxwell School. It uh, was established in, in 1924, and its founder uh, sort of reacted to what he perceived to be a rather corrupt error in government at that time. And so he decided he would establish a school of citizenship and public affairs that would train leaders for public service in both national and international institutions. So that's the sort of raison d'etre for the school. Today, we are home to both uh, social science disciplines, uh, eight altogether, and strong professional degree programs in public administration and international relations. Um, we ha also have 10 interdisciplinary research centers and institutes, of which Center for Policy Research is one of, its, one of our foremost. Uh, we have 800 uh, graduate students here. We do executive education and training programs for leaders around the world. We have 1,800 undergraduate majors in eight of the social science areas. So, you know, that's a, in summary form, this is a pretty big enterprise. There's 160 faculty and residents here and, and, uh, and a number of uh, what we call professors of practice who are former ambassadors, uh, five-star, four-star generals, and so on that, that add to the dimension of the place. Um, Let me also bring you greetings from uh, Dean Jim Steinberg, who uh, unfortunately is on travel today. He's uh, in New York City and would have been delighted to uh, come greet you as well. 
But I'm also delighted to have the opportunity to welcome Jim Fullane back to the Maxwell School and to introduce him to you. He probably needs no introduction to most of you anyway, but let me say a few words about Jim in any case. Jim and I have known each other for most of our professional careers and lives, and he has, was my department chair at a formative time at both our careers. In fact, Len noted that I was a department chair. I succeeded Jim. <laughs> He's a good man and a great friend. Jim has a long list of accomplishments and has been active in the field of housing and mark mortgage market research and practice for over three decades. The time allotted for the introduction won't do his work justice. Dr. Fellain is currently a senior fellow at the Rockefeller Institute of Government, and he's held that since 2010, where he is conducting research about the impact of the Great Recession on the property tax in New York State. Jim has toiled in the housing area in private, public, quasi-public, and academic institutions. He's literally seen this from virtually all perspectives. He's held senior positions at Freddie Mac, uh, well before the crash, I might add, at the Federal Reserve Board, at Fidelity Hanson Quality. And Dr. Fulane has served as professor of economics at Syracuse University for a 10-year period, <clears throat> professor of finance at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He was also served as the president of the American Real Estate and Urban Economics Association in 1988. He has an extensive resume, and his recent work applies stress tests to identifying housing market bubbles before they occur and well before they burst. And a lot of this work is co-authored with Seth, who's delighted to have you back here too, Seth. Um, he's also now studying housing markets in declining cities. Jim? Thank you very much, Mike. It is really a pleasure to be back. I spent 14 incredible years of my career in this building and started it all on the fourth floor over there with Jan, Jerry, Jim Alm, who we're, he's the editor of this uh, journal that we're submitting to. So it's just, I, I come back here on occasion. I just love it all the time. So thank you very, very much. Huge part of my life. Uh, so, you know, giving me like 30 minutes for a presentation is kind of cool. Uh, two minutes to introduce Susan, that's just not, that's not fair. Uh, but that's my goal, and introduce Susan. And uh, PhD in economics, Harvard girl, and uh, originally went into econ, but very quickly moved into real estate at Wharton School. And uh, that is the number one program. She's been with it critical part of the history and, and success of that program. Worked with one of the giants, Jack Goodentag, to get started. Uh, much to talk about. I thought what I would do is just highlight some parts where I got to work or observe her uh, work up close and personal. And uh, one, we were both very active uh, in the American Real Estate and Urban Economics Association. So in 1988, I had the privilege of introducing her as the president of Aruya, and uh, we've interacted on many, many occasions. In the, in the 90s, and I, I, my guess this is going to come up a little bit in her discussion, we were working on the role of the GSEs, Freddie and Fannie, and, and how you tie uh, public goals, affordable housing goals, to a private mission. And I'm sure our thinking has evolved and continues to evolve on that really important issue. Uh, then, late 90s, uh, Susan became a, a presidential appointment to be the Assistant Secretary of Policy Development and Research. Everybody here is very familiar with that phenomenal organization over the years. And uh, uh, she continues to be active in that. Raphael Bostic is the current Assistant Secretary of PDNR, and last year convened a one-day conference on you know, the future of PDNR, and it featured a really interesting discussion with uh, Raphael, John Weicker, who was a former uh, assistant secretary, and Susan, talking about their experiences and how important PDNR has been to uh, research on housing and, and mortgage markets. Uh, another area in which we've interacted, and I think it's going to reflect a little bit of what, what I hope happens here today, we've been part of the Homer Hoyt Institute for about 20 years, a bunch of people who really love doing research on real estate. 
And there, there are groups like this, paper, people come in and give papers. But what's, what's really key about it is it encourages discussion from the audience. So when a new person comes there, a uh, new assistant professor starts to get, we tell them, okay, you're not going to get much beyond the title before someone's going to raise their hand with a question. And, and then the quality of the discussion. In, in, in May, Susan and I uh, kind of kept copious notes of a day and a half uh, symposium like this. And at the end of it, and I hope you all will think of this as well, at the end of it, we, we led a discussion uh, you know, what did we so-called experts learn from this, from this symposium? And I hope you'll think about that. Maybe we'll have a chance to write something at, and, uh, that talks about that short brief on the Maxwell website or something like that. But I hope you'll, you'll do that. And uh, I'm sure she is going to uh, stimulate us today. She's in the middle of this. I just I wanted to mention a little bit about the breadth of her work. It's, I think, I, her resume is 23 pages, just tons of stuff. Uh, she's continuing to work a lot on the GSEs, been asked to testify and, and things of that sort. Uh, of course, you've all read, I'm sure, the classic Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac Implications of Privatization for Social Goals by Jim Fulane, Peter Lindemann, Susan Walker, 1996. <laughs> uh, some of her work is very related to Johnny Sipes. I think we probably first met, she was working on redlining in the, in the 80s, 70s. And we, just, we were at a conference at AEI a few weeks ago. And, and, and we, we listened to all these narratives about the last 30, 40 years. We've lived through it. A lot of you have lived through it. And it's amazing how different they are. But one of the things that I think we all agree with, there were problems in the housing finance system in the 70s. It was not working. And the 80s got worse and many. Something had to be done, I think. And a lot of her work is on that history. And just lastly, just to give you a sense of her breath, I had no idea about this. Here's her most recent book. Uh, women health, women's Health and the World's Cities. I mean, she's just done a lot of stuff and uh, really, really, really happy to have her here with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. That's lovely. So I am um, really honored to be here and I thank you, Jim, and Jan, for inviting me and for organizing this conference. It is indeed a great honor to be part of this distinguished group of scholars who have been and will be important to creating knowledge and to informing policy on housing issues in the 21st century. So my comments today will be on the housing crisis and the way forward. And while there is much that we do now understand about the crisis, there remains many issues which we do not understand, including the lack of consensus on the way forward. So my, I hope my comments today and our discussion, which I think will be very enlightening, will contribute to the ongoing dialogue on the critical issue of how do we reform the housing finance system? Uh, and this is, I believe, the most critical issue for US housing markets in the 21st century. So today, I will briefly refer to um, the evolving understanding of the causes of the crisis. Uh, I have written extensively on that paper that's uh, with my colleague, co-author, Adam Levitan explaining the housing bubble. Uh, but I will focus my comments today on the emerging policy responses that are being currently being put into place. And in my view, the limitations of these policy responses, why alternatives should be found, and the scholarly advances that will be necessary to implement alternative solutions. These alternative solutions that I will be proposing and discussing are not feasible without significant scholarly advances, to which I believe people in this room can and are contributing right now. So 
So we are all, of course, familiar with the huge losses uh, of this crisis. Uh, in the US alone, six trillion plus dollars of housing wealth gone in what was a $16 trillion or so market. How could a small sector, one to two trillion dollars of mortgage finance in subprime and other non-traditional uh, funding of mortgages, how could that possibly lead to such an outcome for the US and of course for global scale destruction of wealth? In a current paper, and, and why housing? In a current paper with, again, my co-author Adam Levitan, we ask that question, why housing? And why can a housing real estate sector in one economy cause a disaster of global dimensions? Now, the policy response is also global in scale. The reworking of the world's financial system which is known as Basel III, and first, and second, the implementation by central banks of what is now being termed macroprudential policy, another major shift. So we not only now have monetary policy, fiscal policy, but macroprudential policy under the domain of central banks throughout the world. Both of these, the reworking of the financial system in Basel, under Basel III and uh, this response by, ongoing response by central banks are often put together under the term macroprudential policy. And both are specifically targeted and focus on housing and real estate and the provision of credit to housing and real estate because this is viewed as the center of the collapse of the world economy. So in the US, macroprudential policy uh, has been both applied to um, uh, Dodd-Frank, that is our implementation of Basel III, and Basel III itself will uh, be um, uh, imposed on uh, banks as we go forward globally, and of course, in the US. Uh, in the US, specifically under Dodd-Frank, there are many, many provisions that are being put into place with regulation right now. Uh, but specifically, what I will refer to are the two um, major uh, uh, lightning rods uh, that have received attention for the new regulatory standards, which are known as qualified mortgages and qualified residential mortgage standards. So these are the two that are the most important in, in Dodd-Frank. But going forward, what is also important is the, and currently, the response of central banks and our own bank, central bank, to uh, bubbles and to their aftermaths. So let me um, back up for a moment and ask the question of why the focus of regulation and new policy on real estate and housing. And the answer, I believe, is the now understood, commonly understood feature of economies where over and over again, financial crises get their start in real estate. So real estate and housing booms have led to financial disasters, financial crisis, over and over again. Now, of course, this most recent episode was a securitization episode. But in fact, more commonly, these episodes are uh, involving banks, as I show in my paper with Richard Herring, titled Real Estate Booms and Banking Crashes, which was written in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis which again is uh, along with my explaining the housing bubble. These are published, but easy to get to them by just going to SSRN. So why is that? Well, it is the banking sector, historically, more than securitization, 
that has over and over again accommodated real estate booms and then crashed, the banking sector crashed with the implosion of real estate prices. And this too, this has happened this time too. So while we understand the crisis from a securitization perspective, of course the crisis in Europe has been a banking crisis in Ireland, in the UK, in Iceland, and most importantly, in an ongoing way, in Spain, which might cause the implosion of the euro. And of course, this has been true, this banking connection in history as well. So why is it? Why real estate and housing are connected through banking to crashes? Why are housing and real estate uniquely vulnerable to credit booms and then sudden stops in provision of credits and disasters? So we, uh, my, again, my, my co-author Adam Levitan and I ex offer an explanation in our paper explaining the housing bubble for the recent crisis. Uh, but in the current paper that we are writing, and is also available on SSRN, we ask the question more generally, not just the recent crisis, why housing? And we come up with three reasons. The first is the lack of short selling in the housing and real estate market, the difficulty to short sell this heterogeneous locally priced asset. Uh, if you had the potential of short selling bubbles, you would limit bubbles. You would curtail bubbles. But rather than this market, optimists rule. The marginal buyer is the optimist, and they set the prices. The worsening of this basic limitation, limits of arbitrage, the worsening of this by the provision of credit through appraisal, there's no alternative, these are, after all, local markets. The worsening of this by the provision of credit, which does not, not just ratifies whatever price is set by the optimist, but the worsening of this by the underpricing of risk. So the overpricing of the asset then is worsened by the underpricing of risk. So the underpricing of risk is due to the lack of trading transparency in the credit markets. So there's lack of trading in the real estate and housing markets, and then there's lack of trading in the credit markets. The lack of, now the credit markets in fact could in theory complete the lack of instruments and could complete the limitations of the real estate and housing market. And I'll come back to that as part of the potential solution to the problem. But as it has been historically through banks, bank portfolio lending, and through securitization, the securitization market has not been transparent. The securities have not traded. Rather, the securities have been marked to model, not marked to market. And they've been opaque. And the securities have been backed by opaque instruments themselves. So the third aspect, third factor in why housing and real estate contribute to crashes over and over again is the lack of a market clearing mechanism in the aftermath of the crisis that leads to equilibrium, single equilibrium. So the market clearing mechanism that prevails after the crisis in the housing market and real estate market, but specifically now in the housing market, which we address in white housing, is the market clearing mechanism itself is defaults and foreclosures. So defaults and foreclosures, foreclosures add to the supply and decrease the demand. So this adds the supply of housing and decreases the demand for housing thus shifting down price expectations and contributing potentially to multiple equilibria and pricing outcomes, which include the potential of a downward price spiral. So with these expectations in place, what is the price now for credit, which is backed by housing? It's the price of housing. It's multiple equilibrium outcome possible. What's the price of credit? 
This helps to explain why a mere $1 trillion of assets can pull a $16 trillion market down. Because the pricing of those assets and the characteristics of those assets, the mortgages in that sub, uh, subprime and non-traditional uh, uh, securitized um, book of credit business, who knew where it was? Who knew what securities were contaminated by the riskiest of the mortgage products, which were likely to pull down securities, which were not trading, which composition was unknown? And how did we know the full picture of the amount of subprime and non-traditional risk that was in the system at the time? So I'll take a moment to aside here. So I was writing about this <clears throat> uh, in uh, 2005, 2006 in a paper with my colleague uh, Andre Pavlov in the inevitability of the underpricing of risk. Uh, we wrote that paper in response to the Asian financial crisis. So we were writing it in uh, the early 2000s after I finished my HUD stint. and. Um, that paper was a very controversial paper because we were saying that what was necessary to price credit in the 2003, 2004, 2005, and therefore to price housing, because housing price depends on the price of credit since borrowers need credit to purchase the home, so the conditions of credit impact housing prices. So it's necessary to price the credit is to understand the characteristics, the terms of the credit that is in its entirety in the system. So I was had the honor of being invited to um, Jackson Hole uh, to speak um, with uh, uh, Chairman Bernanke, in fact, right after him, on this very topic, and uh, in a paper that I did with Richard Green. While I raised these issues then, I really raised them as questions. After the talk, I came into the, this was in 2007, I came into the uh, Jackson Hole Conference thinking, well, housing prices are going to fall, no doubt about that. But we'll get out of this. Uh, 2007, housing prices were already falling. The fall was limited. And there was no, no sign of a recession. So with growth, we will grow into the too high housing prices. Now, I'll come back to what happened in 2007, but now we have, as part of the public record, the minutes of what the Fed was thinking in 2005 and 2006. In 2005 and 2006, according to this, these public records, the Fed believed housing prices were approximately 20% above long-term fundamentals. Again, this is 2005, really prescient, because in the end, by, 2000, by now, of course, the prices were 30% over, and of course, prices continued to rise from 2005, 2006. So they rose another 10%. But what they did not know, and what I found that they did not know in 2007, in August 2007, which terrified me, in which I was quoted right then afterwards, they did not know what the conditions of the credit. They didn't know how much subprime was out. They didn't know the LTV of the subprime. They didn't know the overlay of the stated income, so-called liar loans, how much of the subprime was liar loans. They didn't know how much of the liar subprime loans also had second liens. They were asking me what data are available. I told them about loan performance data, which I had, which they didn't have. And even with that data, it was impossible to get an aggregate sense. I tried, I had an army of PhDs on it, of the degree of risk that was built into the credit standards. There's just no measure. So the problem is then 
that the market clearing mechanism is one of foreclosures, which leads to multiple equilibria prices declining, which leads to a potential illiquidity and insolvency crisis for the credit providing institutions, the financial sector, and sudden stops of provision of credit, which leads to liquidity crisis. Because it is unknown, and at that point, it is known that it is a concern of what the credit is and who is going to replace the credit. So who steps in to provide the credit? Over and over again, the public sector steps in to provide credit in this setting. Entities are, and going forward, will be rescued, backstopped in the aftermath of the crisis because of this multiple equilibrium problem by publicly financed, taxpayer-supported funding that uh, even if private entities are uh, put out of business, which they are not all, goes to public entities and thus contributes to moral hazard going forward. So in this crisis, as we know, public support has come through federal government to primarily Fannie, Freddie, and FHA. And we will be hearing from Chuck Capone more about FHA tomorrow. And most importantly, the public support has come through the ongoing interventions of the Federal Reserve Board to keep interest rates low in an effort to stop the housing crisis from tanking the economy and attempting to push the economy to recover. Specifically, of course, in QE1 and QE2, and just earlier last week, uh, the newly announced QE3 where Chairman Bernanke announced he will purchase $50 billion plus of mortgage-backed securities monthly until the economy improves. But this is not the first time that public entities, whether it be support of Fannie and Freddie or the Fed with QE 1, 2, and 3, that public entities have been stood up to take, oh, and importantly, I should add, of course, FHA, which is the source of purchase mortgages right now. This is not the first time that public entities, which were squeezed and then ex expand and have been stood up to take over the housing finance market after a market crisis. And yet another paper, history paper that I'm currently writing with Adam Levitan, what we call the public option, has provided credit cyclically after crisis after crisis, starting with the Great Depression, and of course, originally, the original Hulk and Fannie Mae and FHA. And then after the SNL, the standing up of Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac. But what differentiates this crisis is the total collapse of private label, of the private market, the private label securitization from producing $700 billion per year of credit to $1 billion of credit for mortgage-backed securities in the current year. And at the same time, what differentiates this crisis and is the response of the public sector, which has been stood up in the as an alternate to this collapsed private sector, is the response of the public sector, which is to dramatically tighten credit standards in the aftermath of the crisis, in the aftermath of the crisis. Now, I was just on a phone call with BIS Steve Conchetti, who's obviously a great researcher and, and regulator, and I innocently, <laughs> I thought, raised something about um, perhaps the pendulum swings. And uh, I'm lucky to be here today because my head was being bit off with the response. Susan, what would you have us do? Make bad loans as we were making bad loans? We need to solve this problem.
So the tightening of lending standards is coming through Basel III on a global scale. And as I mentioned before, it's coming through Dodd-Frank in the US specifically. Now let me take a moment to, um, for those of you who don't know, and I know many of you in this room do know, specifically uh, some of the details of QM and QRM. And I'll be very brief, and I'll focus on QRM. And then in Q&A, we can spend more time if you'd like. So um, QM is, uh, they're both of them, by the way, still in contention. The, uh, maybe surprisingly, these are not going to come out until after the, not surprisingly, until after the election. Uh, uh, QM is, uh, I will talk about the penalties later if you'd like, if, if you do not offer QM or do not offer QRM. Uh, QM is basically going back to a debt to income ratio, uh, which is highly constrictive, still in, in discussion, maybe 28%, maybe 30%. Remember during the crisis, we had easily 50% DTI, and of course, in history, historically, uh, depending on individuals, you could have a DTI, which is far, far higher than that. Um, credit scores right now, although this is not part of either QM or QRM or 740, which is about 60 points higher than 680, which was typical. But let me go to what I think is the most con constraining of the new restrictions that are being discussed. And that is through QRM, and that is the 20% loan to value, which is being discussed, and which is expected to be the policy going forward. Now, at the same time, uh, and let me put it into perspective, uh, you know, why 20%? You know, why is that? And, and it's also in Basel, by the way, for Europe and for global banks. Why 20%? Well, you know, it's a number. It could be 21. It could be 22. Why 20%? Why is that magic? Uh, I think part of it is that historically the standard mortgage, of course, with insurance, it could be as low as 10%, but the standard mortgage was 20%. And more to the point, we did have a 30% downturn in prices. So obviously, now it is known, it is possible, it happened, that prices can fall 30%. So at least with a 20% LTV, you have some cushion for two-thirds of that fall. And in fact, uh, in a session that I had the pleasure to be with, with Ingrid Ellen at NYU, um, day before yesterday, I think it was, uh, the private sector, uh, Wall Street, discussed how they would price such a 20% mortgage going forward. And the pricing actually is very reasonable uh, that they were discussing, assuming that there would be a catastrophic backstop to the MBS that would support the mortgages, but the first loss would be on the private sector. So the first loss that was consensus around the room, the maximum that would require risk return on this standard loan would be 100 basis points, probably significantly less risk premium. So certainly, 100 basis point risk premium, especially today, uh, today historically low interest rates, is affordable, not much. But is a 20% LTV itself affordable for first time home buyers? So there are others that have done work in this which indicate that it, a majority of borrowers could not uh, put down 20%, but just go through the, your numbers yourself. This is the house price, the median house price in the US is 200,000 approximately, 20% is $40,000. How many people do we know who are young have $40,000? Thus, um, the pricing of this product, while reasonable, is not the issue. It's the requirements that are imposed on this product. And, more to the point, the lack of alternative products from the private sector, which might have a higher LTV, maybe a 10% LTV, maybe a 95% LTV. But the private sector is not stepping up to provide mortgage financing at any price, 
with the exception of this one billion boutique placeholder by Redwood Trust. Basically, you know, we're out there just in case we can get this problem solved. And by the way, that's at a 25% uh, down payment, 75% LTV, and it's for jumbo, and it's only for the most pristine of borrowers. So, why is this? I think the basic point is that these standards and these prices and the lack of alternatives from the private sector reflects the backward-looking nature of the participants in this market and of this market. So just as it was before the crisis, expectations of the performance of the market are heavily influenced by the immediate experience of the previous past. This is now viewed as a very risky market, unless we have a 20% LTV, et cetera. Why? Because we had that event, which at the time people, and of course the famous book called a black swan, but now it looks like black swans are out there, and they're priced such as they are we are now going to have this 100-year storm, and the pricing is in, even with a government catastrophic backstop, and it's uh, even more so in the private sector. So the problem, this is mispricing again. The problem is with this is not only that the mispricing is that this backward-looking expectations pricing and regulation leads to. But the problem is this backward-looking formation of price expectations is, and the regulation and pricing that comes out of it, is inherently pro-cyclical. Not only is it pro-cyclical today in the ratcheting up of standards, but it's pro-cyclical going forward. That is, as housing improves and the economy grows, Standards will ease, and the private sector, to a large degree unregulated, will come back. How so and in what form? We don't know, we don't know yet, although I believe mortgage REITs are likely to be, play a large role. But let me suggest a specific way in which the private sector will come back and create pro-cyclicality going forward, continue this pro-cyclical path in the form in which it's likely to return. A major loophole in the current regulations is the lack of regulations on the role of second liens. Second liens. There is nothing to stop a borrower from adding on, after the loan closes, debt and ratcheting up the LTV ratio both in government and non-government insured loans. Right now, the private market is not offering these products. But there is no reason they will not do so going forward. And from all we know, from all our experience we have, this provision is going to be backward looking. That is, it will, when it looks like the market is safe, this credit will come back, and it is inherently pro-cyclical. While in the immediate aftermath of a housing collapse, regulations are stringent, as the market recovers and grows in years ahead, controls will be eased. Moreover, if the past is a guide, regulations themselves are likely to be lifted with more reasonable, in quote, regulations. Dodd-Frank is likely to be eased, QM is likely to be eased, QRM, QRM is likely to be eased, FICO scores are likely to decrease. So as this happens, and also very importantly, attention to the due diligence of mortgages, mortgage applications and mortgage contract originations, is also likely to ease going forward and perhaps go by the way as markets appear healthy and less risky. So 
if standards are seen as, quote unquote, unreasonably by many tight now, which to me they are, they are likely to be eased as the crisis wanes. But then the easing of the constraints themselves is likely to once again contribute to the ratcheting up of demand. Higher prices and yet more credit easing based on higher prices. You see the immediate, you see this immediately. The result is a pro-cyclical outcome. And while this may seem unlikely in today's market, memories dim over time and the immediate past market performance, the immediate past market performance impact on pricing and standards grows. Now I want to take a moment to, which I haven't done uh, in, in these kind of informal comments, talk about what I think is uh, some path-breaking research in this area. And I want to refer to research that is coming to an opposite conclusion, which I've just said. And that is a paper by uh, Sidney Ludvigson and uh, others at NYU, which looks at a general equilibrium framework at the easing of standards. And from that paper's perspective, and we talk about it at length in the White Housing paper, and from that paper's perspective, the easing of standards is exactly what you need and want to smooth consumption over the life cycle. And therefore, the easing of standards ought to be consistent with the following outcomes. Eased smoothing over cycle, therefore less risk in the system as individuals can borrow more to ease and smooth over the cycle. Because there's less risk in the system, yields go down, and asset prices go up. Exactly what we saw in the housing crisis in the years that build up to the housing crisis, 2003, 2004, 2005. Now again, I say exactly what we saw, but we didn't see it. We didn't have the data to see it. So what am I referring to when I say exactly what we saw is in our, after the result, in our paper explaining the housing bubble, what Adam and I did is we went back and we priced deals that were AAA. Now, of course, AAA, what does that mean? And that changed over time, but we did that. We priced deals, AAA deals, and we compared them to treasuries. And basically, the premium dropped dramatically. So while interest rates dropped in this period, they stopped dropping, by the way, in 2004. Treasuries stopped falling in 2004. Mortgage-backed securities yields, both for the AAA piece and the B piece, dramatically continued to decline in 2004, 2005, 2006. But this, according to this general equilibrium approach, is exactly what you would expect in an efficient market for the reasons I just went through. So the only counter to that, because of course if I believe that narrative, then we can all go home and say the world is working fine, and now we have new evidence, new data, and it's priced in, and there's no, no need for procyclicality perhaps going forward. What's missing in that narrative is the assumption that the credit market is innovating. And it's the innovation that's leading to the overcoming of the constraints. What if the credit market is, bad word here, disinnovating? That's what is happening is the credit is becoming cheaper, not because we have, we're better able, capable to price risk, but because we're less able to price risk. That is, there is more opaqueness in the market, less transparency in the market. You would then have to explain why there's more supply of credit into this market. That's a piece that would have to be explained. And in other work that I've done with Andre Pavlov, we look to, many, many other people have played in this space, have looked at the fees and agency conflicts. But the basic point, I believe, in work, my work with Andre, is that at some point, the put option is in the money, 
Everyone is a, becomes short-term players. This is in the uh, Inevitability of the Underpricing of Risk paper. Everyone becomes short-term players and goes for the fees because there is no long-term market, because prices are, in fact, artificially elevated. Thus, there is no long-term. And housing prices for the insiders are, uh, the put option is clearly in the money, and the insiders know this. Leaving aside the agency issues, leaving aside the question of the pricing and the mispricing, how would you know this? This is speculation on my part that this happened. I have this triple A data, et cetera, but it's a slice of the market. How would you know? But that's exactly the point. You wouldn't know. I didn't know. The Fed didn't know. And market participants, many did know because they were in the deals themselves. But only inside market participants would know. The data were not available in the aggregate for the regulators and for the AAA investors who, of course, could not investigate deal by deal. And even if they couldn't, didn't have the data on the loan tapes. The loan tapes were not available to the investors. The loan tapes were not available to the Fed. And to the extent they were available, they lacked data, and the data were wrong. So shortly, we will, have, we will hear what I believe is an important paper, and I will end in a few moments, um, by uh, Seth and Jim. And um, I will have the opportunity to make comments on, those paper, on that paper. But here I, I want to note the importance of their effort. Uh, the new term and concept of macroprudential policy that I have noted has two meanings. One, the setting of standards in the aftermath of the crisis, Basel III and Dodd-Frank, QM, QRM. And secondly, which I believe, you could tell from my comments obviously, I believe this is um, setting a Maginot line, if you will, against the last war, which is likely to be breached going forward by private forces and public easing over time with the result is pro, uh, pro-cyclicality. The other aspect of macroprudential policy, and here I will end, is what I would term mortgage market responsive. Mortgage market responsive, or simply market responsive, macroprudential policy, which reacts to perceived and actual bubbles. So what this entails, and it's being used, is direct market intervention. It's been used by China, it's been used by Korea, it's been used by Singapore, it's been used by Canada. This direct market intervention could, of course, lead to booms and busts itself. And as well, it, it means, it, imply, it is a non-market allocation of credit which is, of course, the point, and goes against the grain for those of us, including myself, who like to rely on market forces. But there is a clear alternative, I believe, that would be lead to the forwarding of macroprudential market responsive policy, and that is called for. And this is the informing of market participants of the likelihood of mispricing of both the underlying asset and of the credit itself through transparency, which would require the collection of data, the verification of data, and the understanding of the totality of the risk in the provision of the credit, the mortgage credit. And also the understanding of the impact of the availability credit and the pricing of credit on the pricing of the underlying asset. Because, of course, that is key to the understanding of current pricing and future pricing. The unsustainable provision of credit will impact, once you have a sudden stop of credit, future prices. And the sustainable impact, obviously, would go the other way. But this interaction of credit market and asset pricing, plus simply un doing the asset pricing itself without bringing in the credit component 
is not a small task. And as I said, it would, for accuracy, you couldn't just simply say, well, let's assume this away. It would, of necessity, have to include the calculation of the impact of credit conditions themselves to characterize real estate, housing, market pricing accurately, and whether it is in a bubble. But what this does not require is a specific local market-by-market market precise calculation of whether the local market is in the bubble or not. The precise calculation is not required, which is a good thing, because this is not possible, as Jim and Seth's paper, I think, clearly points to. And I will return to this point in my comments after. But now let me briefly close by saying why I think this is important. So to policy, and the policy redirection is important. Right now, we are resetting housing policy in the United States. And we're resetting it to rebalance renting and ownership. And of course, this is good. Ownership exposes households to considerable risk of loss, as we've seen. And it's not necessarily a socially valuable outcome in and of itself. The options for renting and choosing choice are important. But let us note that ownership does deliver something. It delivers insurance against rent increases. Now, I believe that going forward, rent increases will not track inflation and, to a lesser extent, wages. But let's focus on inflation. Unlike in the past, I believe there's a regime shift. It's the subject of an entirely different paper. But I believe there's a regime shift, and I think rents going forward in the long run will exceed inflation, although historically they have not. I believe this is likely to be a phenomenon of the 21st century. And I can talk about this if we have time. In short, I believe that rents are likely to increase in the long run. Therefore, ownership, which provides a hedge against rent increases, can, can provide for stability. But this is only so if home ownership itself is stable. Our recent past shows that this outcome is not assured by any means. As real estate economists, identifying and understanding the dynamics of real estate pricing in the short run and long run is what we do. I believe that this is potentially doing this is a large contribution to informing better private and public decision making. There's much work to be done once again I thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to encourage this work. Thank you. Is there time, organizers, for questions, or do you want to just move? Well, we can discuss. I can Sure, not a problem. Uh, I can do this. No, why well, you I teach. Sit down I teach three-hour classes, so <laughs> this is not uh, difficult. There are also many people from the audience: uh, Gary Engelhart, Stuart Rosenthal, Hi, Stuart. Gary Miner, <laughs> who uh, uh, might have something very important to ask or say. And how long do we have? Um, we have basically until 10:30 now. Great. Five Ingrid? So, um, thank you, Susan. That was uh, interesting, provocative. I've got a, a lot of questions for you, but um, let me just start with one, which um, just was triggered by something you just said. So, why is it that you think rents in the long run are going to exceed inflation? I was thinking of your work, Ingrid. Rent, uh, yeah. Actually. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure many, most of you do, Ingrid has done really wonderful work on uh, crime and housing prices, and I was grateful. Uh, 
it's dangerous knowing me because I'll then ask you to do favors and favors and favors for more than once for a contribution to a volume which I was editing. So uh, on that very topic. So <clears throat> I think there's push and pull factors. I think the pull factor is with the work of many of the people in this room and Syracuse Maxwell School and others, we are learning how to do community building. So obviously now housing prices are down 30%. So they're likely to increase slowly with loss aversion, et cetera, over time um, back. But that's going to take some time. But of course what drives housing prices in the long run is rents, giving an interest rate, a discount factor, future rents, et cetera. So I believe the disinvestment in cities, which led to uh, deterioration in uh, housing markets and cities is because of all our efforts. I think we're gonna learn how to community build, so that's one. On the other side, and I've done work on this and I am doing work on this, I believe there is an increase in supply in elasticity. My favorite work as a student was a paper by Fulane et al. on supply elasticity in the United States, which showed one of my favorite, I also love work on uh, discrimination, all of which was so informative to me by you and John and others. So um, you said housing supply was elastic, infinitely elastic in the US. And I think it was. And that's why Chip Case says that housing prices track inflation, period. Because housing supply is infinitely elastic. And by the way, of course, you, don't, you need one more assumption to get to that outcome, which is that the costs uh, don't First of all, it's not endogenous, so that as the market expands, it doesn't increase the price of land. That's the most important. And by the way, other costs more or less keep up with um, uh, cost of labor, et cetera, which with productivity keeps up with inflation. The two balance the cost of labor. Wages go up with productivity, they balance, and therefore housing prices basically just are stable, keep up with inflation, basically because rents do. Okay, that scenario is over. I believe, this housing supply elasticity. And the reason I believe it's over is because of the new environmental regulations, first, and second, the tremendous percentage of land in the West, which is government-owned, Indian tribes, more than two-thirds of many states, state-owned, and also underwater restrictions. So I think we have, which is why places like Boise are so dense. So I don't think that we are in the next, what, we 50, 80 million people over the next, uh, till 2050. It's not as much as people used to think, but we'll, we'll have people. I don't think these, um, this population growth, even if it's less than 1%, we're still one of the fastest growing countries in the world in absolute terms. I don't think this population growth will be accommodated by an expansion west of the Mississippi, which will look like east of the Mississippi. If you look at lights at night, you'll see density east of the Mississippi and a lot of open space west of the Mississippi. It's not there. So those push factors, which are going to create spaces of quality, and the, uh, the pull factor, I should say, and the push factor of we can't recreate suburbs continuously going forward. That is, we don't have an open, elastic supply, not so much of housing, but of municipalities. We won't have an open city system going forward with simply the replication of cities at the same cost as I believe we've had historically. That is a guess. Janet, I'm really sorry I didn't see you behind Stewart, but Janet Wilmot is also uh, an expert on the housing so, Susan, yes. uh, so we have heard many people give their historical narratives, and uh, we were at a conference a couple weeks ago, and I had to get up and leave at once. She came back and patted me on the back and said, take a breath, and we went in and finished it. But that one, it's so refreshing to hear so much overlap in my experiences and in, in what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I want to raise two questions. And I, one of the things that I've talked about is black swan blindness. Yes. And so maybe this is just being good Catholic guilt kind of thing. But I look to economists as being part of the problem in the sense of uh, 
really overstating our understanding of extreme events. Yes. I'm going to ask you about that. And secondly, right. uh, another, I, I, we've, I'm more interested these days in micro prudential versus macro. Yes. The notion of a national housing market is <laughs> just so yes. difficult for me. Yes. The paper you cited that I did 30 plus years ago had 27 national observations. You know, now wow. we deal with Thousands, millions of yeah. records. We've learned so much. Yeah. So one, what is your take on this notion that economists overestimate our ability to predict extreme yeah. events and the importance of local markets? Yeah, so I'm going to hold the latter to okay. comments okay. on your paper, uh, but I will um, comment on the first. So I value your point on this, and I'm struggling with it because we've talked about this before. And I don't 100% know my response, but this is what it evokes for me. It evokes for me that, almost on the contrary, housing economists are too modest. So I'm thinking of two people in particular, and, but I think you, know, you might be a third, and others we know might be fourth, fifth, and sixth, who are, you know, we know some of their work. But uh, two who are public, and I'll maybe talk about one, is Mark Zandi. So Mark Zandi um, is not, a, you know, doesn't obviously do a lot of research, but he depends on research. He's got a research operation. And what he says is that uh, in 2004, 5, and 6, you know, they had, their models were not performing. They had error turns, that is, prices were far too high relative to their predictors in market after market after market. So what did they do? They were they, their, their model is not accurately pricing the, pri the prices that were actually out there. They were coming out with prices which their models which were much lower than the prices that were, in fact, in the market. So what did Zandi do? According to Zandi, what he says is what he did, is he judgmentally went into the, um, so what, um, the implication of that is that there were errors, that his pri his, his, either his models were wrong or markets were wrong. Either markets were wrong or his models were wrong. So he then said, my models are wrong. Markets must be right. My models are wrong. And he just x them out, said, no overpricing, no overpricing, no overpricing. These are correct prices. My market is wrong. He just ratcheted them down. And I think there are others who did the same thing. And uh, in fact, I have a wonderful paper uh, this one in this book that I co-edited in the American um, Mortgage, the American mortgage market. What was that? Ingrid, you contributed that to the American more. I don't know the names of my bot, my, my books. The American mortgage system reform and crisis, something like that, or crisis and reform, something like that. Anyway, a paper by Willen and and others who go through, and actually they have a recent paper that, that takes it a step further. Uh, they go through um, what they believe are many economists and what they said going into the crisis. So I read that paper carefully, and what came out with me, to me, and they do make this point, is there were economists who said, well, it looks like the market's overpricing relative to my work, but um, you know, these are just models, and you know, who am I? I'm just an economist. And, and uh, let me just say, because many people are probably aware that my colleagues, uh, uh, wonderful colleague, Todd Saw and I continue, and Chris Mayer, who was a colleague at that time, I was chairperson of the real estate department, I brought him to the real estate department, did a, what I, with Hilma Farb, did what I thought was a wonderful paper, which was entirely misunderstood, I thought. A wonderful paper was, was written on data up through 2003, which was published in 2004, which pointed to the lack of the bubble, which said that prices are pretty much where they should be, assuming that prices continue to rise as they have historically. But then, in 2004, prices rose again, which they, I, I may have misstated this, that their point was that in the long run, prices continue to raise as historically, but that prices don't increase any more relative to rents. It's a complicated, very good paper, but the bottom line is it's prices relative to user costs and prices relative to rents which they said is barely out of line right now. 
But assuming expectations don't change and assuming that it doesn't get any more out of line, we're okay. But then it did get more out of line in 2005. So right there, if we were in line in 2004 and then prices went up far more than income in 2005, far more than rents in 2005, and there was no decrease in interest rates. So I think, again, that there's a modesty among economists, that we don't want to say we know more. And I felt it too, because I, didn't, I saw that, but you know, I didn't feel as though I had any Say, go, to say something, any say so. So I almost think that there needs to be, but of course I think we are modest, maybe some of us more than others, I apologize if I don't seem so, but um, nonetheless I think we need to value our work and to connect it to the work that's now going to be done, whether we like it or not, by macroeconomists who are looking to put into place macroprudential policy. And whether we want macroprudential policy or not, and I'm not so sure I want it, at least we need to have the information come out that should inform what market participants do. Johnny. Johnny. So um, I uh, greatly enjoyed that uh, wonderful overview. Um, one thing you didn't mention that uh, I'm just curious to get your view on is uh, when the market started to get very opaque, it opened up opportunities for people to uh, really take advantage of the situation, uh, and for example, in the form of predatory lending. And uh, I, um, it's yes, been I my... Yes, I didn't use the word predatory lending, I right. noticed. Right. And I'll come back to why. was. Okay, well, I, I just wanted, uh, that's my question, yeah, is why why important. wasn't that that part of your analysis? Now, obviously, right. uh, there's a lot going on in the background that doesn't require predatory lending to make it happen, but predatory lending seems to me to be a big part of the specifics of what happened and how bad it got and who Absolutely. it hit. Absolutely. So let me respond to that, and I'm, I'm sort of gun-shy on that very question, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But before I tell you why I'm gun-shy and don't use that word, um, I want to make the point that you can have real estate uh, booms and banking crashes that are just as destructive as the one we just had without predatory lending. Japan and the decade, lost decades, that was housing prices and land went up 100% and then collapsed. Uh, Ireland, I don't think anyone's saying it's predatory lending in Ireland, destroyed the banking system. Spain, I don't think that people are calling that predatory lending. So my focus of my comments today were, uh, was on securitization and the risk of the securitization. Now, there is absolutely no doubt about it, and um, that's what I was implying, referring to. The book of business and the characteristics of that book of business and the risk of the mortgage instrument itself, the risk of the mortgage product, does increase the risk of the entire book of business and should be priced in, and more to the point, their issues of fraud and unfair practices. So now let's go back to why I'm gun shy on this. So I, um, and also why I'm, I'm, I'm not emphasizing predatory lending. Two reasons. One, the consumer protection um, agency I think is very important. And I think it will stop um, predatory lending practices going forward, which I think is important. When I was in HUD in 2000, we did a report, the first report, I think, at the time, on predatory lending practices. We did it with the Department of Justice. We did it jointly. And we testified, I testified to Senate on this topic. And the senators, particularly Senator Graham, came back with, what's predatory lending? How much of it is out there? We couldn't answer. I did a paper with uh, like six colleagues, including Pat McCoy, Raphael Vostick, you know, everyone, all my friends. And we looked at the, uh, uh, it's on anti-predatory lending statutes state by state, two papers. And one paper, uh, a reviewer came back and said, what's predatory? So I think we know it when we see it. This is now we're shifting into 
unfair practices and legal terms and discrimination, and there's certainly evidence of discriminatory pricing. That's why we have hundreds of billions of dollars of settlements right now happening on discrimination as part of this opaqueness and price discrimination economically and price discrimination on racial and ethnic uh, characteristics. It seems to be in the, in the data. But I don't think solving that in itself, and it has to be solved for societal reasons, solves the other problem. So that's why it was a focus of my remarks. Although, having said that, I apologize because I am in the place which has done more work to help our society overcome the issues of discrimination which are so severe than any other institution in this country, and I'm grateful for the work you all have done. Yeah, Susan, I was struck by a couple of your, of, of your comments. Uh, the first is the idea that, that, that house prices can't fall, okay? That seems to be, seems to have been widely shared by, by the market. Uh, we don't need to go to Japan and we don't need to go to Ireland to look to see that house prices fall. House prices have fallen in the U.S. Of the, of the magnitude, roughly of the magnitude that we've seen, uh, that we've seen nationally here. You can just go look in Houston in 1984. You can look, you can look in the early 90s on, on, in the coast, and you can find very large prices. So the idea that prices could fall sh substantially shouldn't be new. The fact, so it raises the interesting policy question of, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you, construct policies for market players who just ignore history, right? I mean, if, if, you're, gonna, if you're gonna ignore the fact that, that prices, prices have fallen in, in the United States of 25, 30% in the past, and you just simply ignore it, then how do you, how do you make policy? And uh, that, that's kind of the first, the first comment. The second comment is on, on the 20% the 20, the 20 down payment. Uh, if you were to go back, you know, 20, 25 years, and you were to ask, uh, you were to ask housing and real estate economists, uh, do you think that a 20% down payment mortgage is draconian, which is often the way it is now presented uh, in, in, in the industry, I don't think people would have said, oh, that's, that's just, you know, that's incredibly, it's an incredibly high down payment uh, requirement. Because even 20 years ago, you know, a 20% down payment was internationally was a very low down payment standard. In fact, Jim, you, Jim Fillane and I were at Keough Island probably 20 years ago when, when Bob Van Order was 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 talking about you know, Freddie going down to a five low down payment loans. They presented that paper on low down payment loans, right? And Freddie was trying to price these things. So the idea, there's kind of a hysteresis that's going on, right? The idea that somehow 20% is, is really draconian. We've gotten used to these, these really down pay, low down payment loans, but when 20% used to just be the standard. And we didn't think 20 years ago that this was a bad thing. And somehow now we think it's a really bad thing. So I think that's, I mean, I think that's very interesting uh, as well, is, is, is the hysteresis that, that seems to have happened. Um, and it's not just for the people who make money on, on originating loan, uh, mortgages either. I mean, there seems to be this general, this general view that, that, that that's really draconian to go back to that type of loan. So maybe we can have general conversation on this and I come back to um, it after perhaps we have general conversation because I think both of these points are important. Let's focus on the second point for a moment. But my point is not that 20% is too tight, although we could discuss why I think it is, but this is why I think it is. Um, in this context, it's a more, more focused issue, which is whatever you choose, is it 20%, is it 25% today, in the aftermath of this crisis, is going to change. It, mark my words. It is going to ease up over the cycle. So whether it comes from second liens in refinancing, whether it comes from mortgage REITs, whether it comes 
20% is not going to prevail. It's going to go back to 10% to 5%. And I'm just suggesting that we track it when it changes. So I don't have a policy suggestion on what that should be, but I'm just suggesting that we know what it is, because right now we don't know. Now on the question of, um, so what if we did know? Would that affect market participants? Well, that's a very good question. And that gets to issues which many people in the school know far better than I do, of optimal policy making and informing the private sector. And <clears throat> since what I believe is that it's not just a question of maintaining standards, but that standards are likely to be eased as the cycle advances, not only on the part of the private sector, but public regulators too will ease up because they are co-opted. So I think the feet that have to be held to the fire is the public sector not to dramatically ease up counter pro-cyclically. And I think the only way to do that, but again, this is out of my field, is to have it out there what is happening to the book of business. That's the only way they didn't turn around to the regulators and say, you're not doing your job. We happen to know what the job is that you're doing, and you're not doing your job. But how do we hold them accountable if we don't know what's going on? So according to um, Morgan Stern in a New York Times um, a reporter in her book with Joshua Rosner, uh, she says um, that the regulators were very aware that they were easing standards, the regulators of WAMU, the regulators of of countrywide, and it's in the data of the commission as well. They were, they were aware they were doing this. They were co-opted. We weren't aware, or at least we weren't aware in a way that we could call them on it. So tracking that information is my point. So uh, the other question of what should the down payment be is, I think, a really important question. But I don't have the answer to that. Ten thirty. Yeah. Thank you. That was great.